My dearly beloved in Christ, I would like this morning for the sermon to speak about the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, and this will be the first of a series of sermons over the next three Sundays. And I decided to do this because, especially as I teach our students, I reflect upon the fact that they have no awareness of what the Novus Ordo Mise is. And by the grace of God, probably the majority of our parishioners have never been to a Novus Ordo. And I think it's very important for us to understand what it is, how completely wrong and opposed to the true Mass it is, so that we are forewarned and we, we realize it, the error. And I mention this because every now and then I hear the tragic news that a faithful parishioner for many years, someone who attended exclusively the Tridentine Latin Mass, went over to the Novus Ordo Church. And I think to myself, how on earth could that happen? It is only because they don't understand what the true Mass is and what the Novus Ordo is, a mockery really, of the true Mass. And so I want to go into the Novus Ordo Mise so that you understand it, but we're going to begin with an understanding, begin today, by discussing the true Mass. What is the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass? And notice we always refer to it as the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, because the Mass is a sacrifice. So let's begin there. What is a sacrifice? Now, we use the term sacrifice for many things. When you have to give up something you want, you will say, well, I made a sacrifice. Our Lady said to the children at Fatima to sacrifice yourself for sinners, to make sacrifices for sinners. So that's a a meaning of the word that we commonly use. But when we're going to talk about the formal meaning, the strict sense of sacrifice, we are referring to an offering by which a victim is taken and destroyed to give honor to Almighty God. And this concept of immolating a victim for the honor of God is, you might say, impressed on our human nature, on our consciousness, because we see it done from the very foundation of the world, the very first family, Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain and Abel. And we read in Genesis how they offered sacrifice. Cain was a farmer. He offered the produce from his labors. And Abel was a herdsman, and he offered a lamb, or lambs. Now, we also read that God rejected the sacrifice of Cain but he was pleased with the sacrifice of Abel. And we don't know exactly why, but we presume that Cain offered the leftovers. He offered the fruits that he didn't really want, whereas Abel offered the best of his flock to God. But once again, notice this sacrifice. Who told them to offer sacrifice? It was something that their human nature incline them to do, to give honor and glory to Almighty God. After the great flood, what is the very first thing that Noah did after the flood? He built an altar and offered sacrifice to God. Thanksgiving for his preservation from the deluge and that of his family, and in atonement for sin and in adoration to Almighty God, These are the four purposes of sacrifices, adoration, thanksgiving, atonement, and then, of course, petition. The four ends for which the Mass is offered, because the Mass is a sacrifice. So as I said, human nature understands the need to give worship to God. And so we find even pagan tribes and peoples offering sacrifices, sometimes even going to the absurdity of human sacrifice. But why would they offer various things to God? Because of their awareness of their indebtedness to their Creator. Now, with Moses, Almighty God himself gave very detailed instructions about how he was to be worshipped in the Old Testament. 
what types of sacrifices were to be made, who was to offer them. God told Moses to take his brother, Aaron, and consecrate him as the first high priest. And then there were the other priests and the Levites to assist Aaron in the worship of God. And there were sacrifices every day. Some of these sacrifices were of fruits, incense, wine. Others were sacrifices of animals. And again, it was a very detailed instruction that you can read in the books of the Old Testament, especially Leviticus and other books in the Old Testament. So this was done throughout the Old Testament from the time of Moses up until the coming of our Lord. And when our Lord died on the cross, the veil in the temple was rent in two from top to bottom to show that the sacrifices of the old law had passed away. In fact, those sacrifices in the old law would have had no merit, no value, except in view of the future sacrifice of our Lord on the cross. Because that was the perfect sacrifice. And notice that the sacrifice of our Lord on the cross was a true sacrifice. Because you had a victim, which was Jesus himself, the Son of God. You had a priest to offer the victim that was also our Lord. And he immolated himself on the altar of the cross, the wood of the cross. So the Mass was indeed a sacrifice. And the night before he died, at the Last Supper, our Lord instituted a new sacrifice, the sacrifice of the new law. And he changed bread and wine into his body and blood. And he told the apostles, do this in remembrance of me. So he instituted the holy sacrifice of the Mass. So what is the Mass? The Mass is the unbloody renewal of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. And we must always remember that, essentially, what the Mass is. A sacrifice, the renewal of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. And imagine every day the holy sacrifice of the Mass being offered, Christ offering to his heavenly Father his life, the perfect sacrifice. Without that, the world would indeed merit to be punished severely by Almighty God for its crimes. But every day there is that propitiatory sacrifice of the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And this was prophesied in the Old Testament some 400 years, four or 500 years before Christ. There was a prophet named Malachias. And this is what he said. From the rising of the sun, even to the going down, My name is great among the Gentiles, and in every place there is sacrifice, and there is offered to my name a clean oblation. And that's Malachi chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. And I think to myself, how strange those words were to the ears of the Jews before the time of Christ. Because they had been taught that there could be sacrifice in only one place, And that was the temple. We know that on Pentecost Sunday, there were Jews from every nation under heaven, it says in the Acts of the Apostles, that had gathered in Jerusalem and therefore were there when the Holy Ghost came upon the Apostles. And why were there Jews from all these nations under heaven? Because they could not have sacrifice in their cities, in their countries, so they went to Jerusalem. They made this pilgrimage at certain feast days. Now, the Jewish people had in their various towns, like we know our Lord taught, in the synagogue of Nazareth. And a synagogue was a meeting place where they would gather to pray, to read the scriptures and have them explained. But they could only have sacrifice in the temple in Jerusalem. But again, when our Lord died, the veil of the temple was rent in two to show that the old law was over. And now there is no sacrifice pleasing to God except the holy sacrifice of the Mass. So this is the first thing we must understand with the Mass. Fundamentally, what it is a sacrifice. The unbloody renewal of the death of our Lord on the cross. And his passion and death are 
remembered in every Mass. St. Paul, in his first epistle to Corinthians, says those words, as often as you eat of this bread or drink of this cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. So that idea of our Lord's death is is called to mind. Again, St. Paul says in today's epistle, our Lord died once for sin and he dies no more. But his death on the cross is represented by the separate consecration of bread and wine because on the cross our Lord shed his blood. So the Mass is the unbloody renewal of that sacrifice. Again, symbolized by the separate consecrations. And it is the perfect sacrifice that pleases Almighty God, the Heavenly Father. We should treasure every Mass that we can attend. We should make certain that we attend with attention and devotion. Use your missal, or if you have not a missal, to pray perhaps the sorrowful mysteries of the rosary, or to meditate upon the passion of Christ, to offer prayers of adoration, thanksgiving, reparation, petition, but to attend the Mass with the utmost devotion and attention, understanding what it is, the greatest thing on earth, the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And think about this as well, what Malachi said in the prophecy, that in every place there is sacrifice. The Mass goes on all over the world, wherever there is a true priest offering the true Mass, So we might be asleep in the middle of the night, but there is a Mass being offered in Europe or in Asia or wherever, wherever the Mass is to be found. So continuously, we refer to the Mass as the continual sacrifice because given the different time zones, it is offered continuously throughout the world. Now, knowing this, the devil has always sought to destroy the Mass. Martin Luther, in particular, detested the Mass. And so he changed it. But the Lutherans, under Martin Luther, still used what were Catholic churches. They no longer used an altar. They brought in a table. And he changed the name. He called it the commemoration of the Lord's Supper. And changed around the wording and so forth. And changed the Mass. And that is exactly what has been done since Vatican II the Novus Ordo Mise. And it's important that we understand it because it is an abomination. It is a rejection of the true Mass. It is simply a meal, commemoration of the Lord's Supper. It is a Protestant service. It is displeasing to Almighty God. But the holy sacrifice of the Mass, which alone pleases the Heavenly Father, We unite ourselves with the priest. We offer our lives, our sacrifices, our daily duties with the priest as he offers to the Heavenly Father the one perfect sacrifice, Jesus Christ, in an unbloody manner every day in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. May we always treasure and appreciate Holy Mass. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. My dearly beloved in Christ, last Sunday's Gospel was on the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, and as I mentioned, it was the first of a short series that I would like to give on the true Mass in comparison to the Novus Ordo Mise. And you will recall that last Sunday I quoted from the prophet Malachi, who said, From the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same, My name is great among the Gentiles, for in every nation there is offered to me a sacrifice, a clean oblation for sin. And all of the fathers are in agreement that the prophet Malachi, who wrote this four or five hundred years before Christ, was referring to the institution of the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And it is wonderful to think that with the various time zones of the world, that throughout the day, Mass is going on somewhere in the world, the continual sacrifice. And it has been said that the world could more easily exist without the Son than without the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Why? Because the Mass, once again, is Jesus himself offering his life 
to his Father, to atone for sin, to draw down God's mercy and blessings upon the world. And so how much we need the holy sacrifice of the Mass. But this also would help us understand why the devil hates the Mass. And the devil has always sought to destroy the Mass using various human beings, heretics, and so forth, to seek to destroy the Mass, which is his goal. Our Lord, as recorded in the 24th chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel, when he was talking about the end of times and the coming of Antichrist, etc., he said, when you see the abomination of desolation in the holy place, then you know the time is at hand. Well, St. Alphonsus Liguori, a doctor of the church, says that our Lord was referring to a time when the true Mass would be taken away and would be replaced by a false Mass, a, a ceremony that would be an imitation of the true Mass, but not the true thing. And of course, we believe that is the time in which we live. But this has happened before. In the Reformation, the so-called Reformation, Martin Luther, who had been a Catholic priest, left the church, and he had some very severe words about the Mass. He said, call it the Lord's Supper, the commemoration of the Last Supper, a meal. Don't call it the sacrifice of the Mass. He particularly did not want that term used, sacrifice. And he took the Mass, as it was, and he changed it around and brought in another ceremony for the people, much the same as has been done over the last 50 years. Also in England, the same thing was done under King Henry VIII and Archbishop Cranmer, again, bringing in a different ceremony, calling it the Lord's Supper, having the priests face the people, having it in the vernacular, all the things that happened since Vatican II. So the devil has always sought to destroy the Mass, and again, he has used human instruments to try and bring this about. But in our times, those who have brought about the Novus Ordo Mise are the modernists. Now, Pope St. Pius X in 1907 condemned the heresy of modernism. And he said that modernism is a synthesis of all the heresies that is, have existed down through the centuries. To put it in a very simple way, modernists are those who believe in relativism. In other words, what was wrong 200 years ago to a modernist maybe isn't wrong today because they believe that changing times necessitate changing morality and changing doctrine. So modernists believe in relativism, but they also are fanatics when it comes to change. They like to change. They want everything to change. And even before the 1960s, going back to the 30s and the 40s, there were a few priests here and there infected with modernist ideas who began to experiment, turned the altar around, had the priest face the people, put certain things in the vernacular, and so forth. And Pope Pius XII found out about this, and he wrote an encyclical, a masterpiece, on the liturgy called Mediator Dei. I believe it was published in 1947. And in that encyclical, interestingly, he says that there are certain individuals who would like to change the Mass and change it into the language of the people, the vernacular who would like to turn the altar around. And he went on to list different things that people wanted, that modernists wanted. And he showed how wrong all of these ideas were and condemned them. And what's interesting is you might think this encyclical was written after the Novus Ordo came in, because everything he condemns and forbids was eventually done. The modernists used what I would refer to as the liturgical movement. The liturgical movement is a term we use for the greater emphasis on the liturgy over the past couple hundred years. The modern liturgical movement began around the year 1850. 
1840s, 1850s, with a monk, an abbot in France named Abbot Geringer. <clears throat> and Dom Prosper Geringer studied the liturgy, promoted an increase of scholarship on the liturgy. He published a 15-volume work called The Liturgical Year, which is an absolute treasure, and, promote, and wrote a number of other books. So this inaugurated, again, a movement to learn more about the liturgy, to appreciate it more. So the liturgical movement was good, but it was eventually hijacked by the modernists. Also, other good changes were Pope St. Pius X promoted frequent Holy Communion, any early Holy Communion for children. He promoted um, the use of Gregorian chant, wrote his fam famous motu proprio on uh, music in the sacred liturgy. He also promoted the use of the Missal, where you have Latin on one side and then English or whatever the language of the different countries so you could understand the prayers the priest was saying. And so there were these various efforts made to understand and appreciate and value, as we should, the sacred liturgy. But again, the modernists used this movement to bring all these changes into the liturgy. But these changes didn't come overnight. They weren't all at once, they were gradual. And this is why people back in the 1960s continued to go to church and one Sunday this would be changed and another Sunday that would be changed. And over time, they accepted this Novus Ordo Mise because they were prepared for it. And I will go into, especially next Sunday, some specific changes made in the Novus Ordo Mise. But I would like to talk today more about some general observations. And first of all, the change of language. Why is the Mass said in Latin? Because the modernists said, we need to have the Mass in the language of the people because the people don't understand Latin. How many people know Latin? And so we need to make sure they understand it. Well, there are several fallacies in that argument. Number one, the people were not completely ignorant because, as I said, they had missiles with Latin and English, and they could follow the English. They knew the prayers the priest was saying. But another point is, do they even need to know what the priest is saying? The priest is taking the place of Christ and offering the Mass to God. You could have an illiterate person, as you did in the Middle Ages, not that many people could read or write, who wouldn't know the prayers, but that person is there in the church devoutly praying, mentally joining his or her will to that of the priest offering the Mass and obtaining many graces. Think back to the Old Testament, back before you had microphones to amplify sound. You had this huge temple, and there was the priest way up there offering the sacrifice. And those who were there in the temple couldn't hear the ritual prayers the priest was saying as he made the sacrifice. They were too far away. But that didn't mean that somehow the sacrifice was less important to God or to those in attendance. And also, after the return of the Jews from the Babylonian captivity, hardly anyone spoke Hebrew anymore. And yet the liturgy in the Old Testament was still in Hebrew. And so the people now spoke Aramaic due to the long captivity, 70 years in another country. And so Hebrew was now only known by the rabbis, the scholars. It wasn't spoken by the people. And that didn't mean, again, that the sacrifices were any less important. So that is, uh, again, a, uh, an argument that is made that doesn't hold water. In fact, I would say, well, if the people can understand it so much better, how come so many Catholics have left the church? How come so many people stopped going to Mass and went into other religions or just did nothing? So you can see the fallacy of that argument. But why do we have the Mass in Latin? Because for several reasons. First of all, Latin is a dead language, by which we mean it is not spoken in any country in the world as the common language of the people. 
And consequently, the meaning of the words does not undergo a change. We speak English, really I should say American, because some of the words we use have a different meaning for someone in England or Australia or some other country where English is spoken because it's a living language and undergoes a change over time. Even the way we speak English today is different from the style or the way people spoke it in this country 200 years ago. So it's a living language. Whereas Latin is the ideal language for the liturgy where the meaning of the words will not change and therefore it preserves doctrinal integrity. Also, Latin serves as a wonderful mark of the unity of the church. You could go, before Vatican II, you could go to any country, go into a Roman Catholic church, and the Mass would be the same as it was in your parish church. And you could attend and understand. The priest gets up and gives a sermon, you have no idea what he's saying, but you would feel at home because the Mass was the same. Also, the fact that not everybody knows Latin, in fact, most of the people don't know other than some words, that lends itself to convey the mystery, the the sacredness of the rite of Holy Mass. So it adds to the dignity and the beauty and the solemnity of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, which is worship being given to Almighty God. So that is why the Mass is in Latin. Early on, the Mass was offered in Greek. And scholars believe that it began to universally throughout Europe being offered in Latin beginning around the middle of the 3rd century, maybe a little more, in the 200s. And ever since then, Mass has been offered in, in Latin. And also, this is an interesting point, that um, the Mass, as we say it, what we refer to as the Tridentine Mass, because of the count, Tridentine comes from the word Trent, the Council of Trent, which uh, made it known or, or decreed that uh, a new missile was to come out. And the purpose of the missile was to make sure that there was unity, because there were some minor changes from one country to another, one city to another, one diocese to another, and in order to have uniformity. But when Pope St. Pius V promulgated the Roman Missal in 1570, he didn't come up with a new Missal. I believe the only thing he added was the last Gospel of St. John, which was said in some places and not others. And he said the Mass is to be the same, it's never to be changed again until the end of time. And he said, if anyone will dare to tamper with or change even one word of the Mass, he will incur the wrath of God and of the holy apostles Peter and Paul. And I believe those words of St. Pius V were prophetic because he knew a time would come when efforts would be made to change the Mass, as has happened, sadly, over the last 50 years. Also, the Mass, even, even before Pius V, was virtually the same as it was at the time of St. Gregory the Great and even before. We believe that the prayers of the canon were written by St. Ambrose, who lived in the 4th century. So the Mass has existed almost entirely unchanged for at least 1,500 years or longer, until again the modernists change it. So we mentioned Latin, why we have the Mass in Latin. Another general observation about the change of the Novus Ordo Mise was the complete elimination or loss of reverence. If the Mass is the worship of God, then we must be reverent, attentive. We must realize we're in the presence of God. But look at what happened when the Novus Ordo came in. People were told when they came up for communion to stand instead of to kneel. They now receive communion on the hand. And lay people get up and become Eucharistic ministers. And there was always an excuse for every change. So the excuse was, oh, the priests, we don't have that many priests and they're busy and they have a lot to do. So what happens now in a typical Novus Ordo church? The lay Eucharistic ministers give up to give out communion and the priest goes and sits down in a chair. So you can see the 
the fallacy of that argument, just like all of their arguments for a, a means of trying to change and get people to accept the changes. But the loss of reverence. I remember reading a bulletin that someone gave me like 20 years ago from a church with the, has the Novus Ordo. And in this bulletin, it had an article on what it called the gathering right. And it said, you might be annoyed when people come into church and they're talking in the church before Mass because you might want to pray, but that's being selfish. You should join in because God is love and God wants us to be joyful. And so there should be this conversation and greeting your neighbor before Mass and so forth. A complete loss of the sense that the church is the house of God and that the Mass is offered to God. Everything now has been focused on the people and the social aspect, the communal aspect, and again, a loss of reverence. So the lack of kneeling, some churches even eliminated kneelers altogether. The priest, when he is ordained, his hands are anointed with the sacred oil. His hands are consecrated so that he can handle worthily the Holy Eucharist. And now anyone and everyone goes up, receives it in the hand, hosts are fall on the floor, they're found left in the pews, all kinds of sacrileges. And so we see this loss of reverence. When you look at the Novus Ordo Mise, what really strikes one especially is the loss of reverence. During the holy sacrifice of the Mass, the canon and the offertory, the priest prays the prayers in a silent voice. Why? Because of the mystery and the Mass is offered to God. And now it's out loud. Again, there's, there's a loss of all of the sense of mystery. So next Sunday, I will go into the new Mass, the Novus Ordo Mise, in greater detail, the different parts of the new Mass. But let us especially appreciate the holy sacrifice of the Mass, that we have the grace to understand, to reject the Novus Ordo Mise, and to realize that this Mass, the Tridentine Mass, is the true Mass pleasing to Almighty God. May we never take it for granted and may we always be attentive and reverent at every Mass that we are privileged to attend. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. My dearly beloved in Christ, two Sundays ago, I began what I called a short series of sermons, and today will be the final one. So a series of three sermons on the Mass, and in particular, the true Mass, as compared to, as opposed to, the Novus Ordo Mise. And I had decided to do that because I was reflecting upon the fact that the majority of our young people have had the tremendous privilege and grace of never having to go to the Novus Ordo, growing up with the true Mass. But the flip side of that is that they could be unaware of the problems with the Novus Ordo Mise and why we must reject it. And I particularly thought that it would be beneficial to do so because of recently having heard, not of this parish, but of two individuals who having gone to the, attended the Tridentin Latin Mass for many years, went over and joined the Novus Ordo. And I thought to myself, how could they do that? They must not understand what the Novus Ordo is, not just another form of the Mass, but in fact, not even a Mass at all. Now, those of us who grew up traditional Catholics, but then the Novus Ordo came in, and so you might say we were victims of having had the Novus Ordo put upon us, but realized something was wrong, and by the grace of God were able to understand what was wrong and to reject the Novus Ordo, we were benefited by many books. And I would like to just mention a few of them. But likely, the majority of you have never read and probably never even heard of these books. So I'm just mentioning some of the books that were helpful to me way back in 19, early 1970s. This one I like is called AA 1025. And it's about... It tells about the 
plans of those who wanted to destroy the mass, how they were going to do it. And the way they would do it would be to promote good things, but exclusively to promote those things. So love, joy, charity, and just simply talk about love all the time. But they didn't talk about sin. And if you practice true charity, that includes, and it begins with, love of God. And love of God means we don't offend him. But the Novus Ordo became this um, very humanistic uh, atmosphere like a party. You know, they brought in the guitars in the church, etc., and it became like a big party instead of the worship of God. So that book brought that out. And then when the Novus Ordo came in in the late 1960s, an excellent book was written by Patrick Henry Omler called Questioning the Validity of the Masses Using the New All-English Canon. And this is before the Novus Ordo itself became obligatory, but they brought in in the canon in English, and they had four different canons. And that's one of the things about the Novus Ordo, is the priest has all these choices he can do, instead of the Mass as we have always had it, where this is the way it is. So, one of the things that was noticeable in the new Mass was in the consecration of the wine, the change of the word many to all, instead of saying, this is the chalice of my blood of the new and eternal covenant, the mystery of faith, which shall be shed for you and for many unto the remission of sins. Now the wording was, it shall be shed for you and for all men. Well, that was a quite a striking change because our Lord in the Bible used the word many at the Last Supper. He did not use the word all. And so why then would they change it? Well, that would be to fit in with the theology of Vatican II, which was one of ecumenism, of trying to break down any barriers between Catholics and non-Catholics, our separated brethren, as they called them, and to promote interfaith and ecumenism. So they wanted a mass that would be acceptable to others. But notice this, all men. What is the theological problem? That is that even though Jesus died for all men, all men were redeemed, but not all are saved. Many are saved. And at the consecration, our Lord was making reference for those who, who would cooperate with the grace of redemption and achieve salvation. And so in that sense, his blood was shed for many. But this change of a, a major word in the form of consecration would invalidate the consecration. So the bread and wine would not be changed into the body and blood of Christ. And that's how serious that is, as is explained in that book. Another excellent book on the Mass is written by Dr. Kumar Zwami, The Problems with the New Mass. And the nice thing about this one, it is not too detailed, too lengthy, too long, because there's another one, actually just published five or six years ago, by Father Anthony Cicada. And as you can just see by the spine, it's quite a thick book, very detailed. And it's called, interesting title, The Work of Human Hands. And that is taken from the offertory in the New Mass, the work of human hands, and I'll go into that. But really, the entire no Novus Ordo Mise is a work of human hands. It's not divine. It does not come from the saints like the Tridentine Mass, the prayers written by holy men, etc., 17 or so centuries ago. So <clears throat> that is a very detailed work. But a, a shorter one, and this actually is formed one of the chapters, but was written years ago by Father Chicada, called The Problem with the Prayers in the New Mass. And it's very interesting because he wanted to know, when they wrote the Novus Ordo Mise, and I mentioned to you last Sunday that it was written by, the one in charge was a Monsignor Annibale Bunini, an Italian Monsignor, and he was assisted by, among others, seven, six or seven, Protestant ministers who were invited to the Vatican to help rewrite the Catholic Mass. Now, obviously, that doesn't make any sense to us, but that was done in order to make it acceptable to non-Catholics. But Father Cicada wanted to know, well, what did they do 
when they wrote the Novus Ordo Misa about the orations, the prayers. So you know that right before the epistle, there's a prayer we call the collect. And at the end of the offertories, there's the secret. And after communion, there's what is called the post-communion prayer. So he looked at these orations, and they didn't write them from scratch when they wrote the Novus Ordo Misa, the new missal. What they did was to take the previous prayers and to go through them and with a marker, you might say, to blot out any phrase that they didn't want. And he found, as he noticed these changes, a recurrence of certain references, certain phrases. For example, anytime there was a reference in the traditional prayers of the Mass to penance, mortification, renouncement of the spirit of the world, sacrifice, punishment for sin, the need to pray for the faithful departed, any reference to miracles, all of these, those things were studiously avoided. It wasn't just occasionally, it was all the way through. Anytime there was a reference to renouncement of the spirit of the world, that would go, blot it out. And so that's what they did to get their prayers for the new Mass. They took the previous ones, but took out anything that didn't fit in with the theology, the new theology of Vatican II, which was one of embracing the world and no longer worrying about sin and the consequences of sin and not talking about hell and purgatory anymore and so forth. So that's very interesting, and that's in this smaller book. And one last book I will make reference to and talk about is called The Ottaviani Intervention. And it's not really a book, it's a, it's a lengthy letter. And what happened is when the Novus Ordo Mise came out, I think it was finally written in 1968 or 69, it was offered in the presence of 50 or more bishops and cardinals who were invited to the Vatican and there was a chapel where they had the priest say this new mass, this Novus Ordo, and it was to be observed by all these bishops and then they were to give their recommendation. Well, about half, it might have been a little less than half, rejected it. They did not want it. And several of them got together and they commissioned some renowned theologians in Rome that taught at the different universities, the Gregorian, the different universities in Rome, to write a study of the Novus Ordo Mise. And that was done, the study by these Roman theologians, and then that was presented to Paul VI with a cover letter signed by Cardinal Ottaviani and Cardinal Bacci, two renowned cardinals, staunch elderly cardinals who were Cardinal Ottaviani had been in charge of the uh, Holy Office for years. So he was a theologian, knew his faith well, and, and was wary of any changes of errors coming in. Well, there were other bishops that, wanted, that had planned on signing on to the letter, but then they got cold feet and they didn't sign because I think word got out that this was being done and they were worried about repercussions. But these two cardinals did sign the letter and, of course, it fell upon deaf ears was just simply rejected. But the letter was then published, and it's very interesting. And one of the things I will say that the theologians said in the letter, after they had seen the Novus Ordo Mise, they said, this new Mass represents a radical departure from the theology of the Mass as defined by the Council of Trent. And I mentioned that in the past couple of sermons, how the Mass, the true Mass, is a propitiatory sacrifice. And that word sacrifice was completely eliminated. Although there's maybe a couple references in the introduction to the new mass that makes reference to a sacrifice of praise, but they never refer to it as the renewal of Calvary, the unbloody sacrifice of Calvary, of the cross, or they never use the word propitiatory sacrifice, which is what the mass is, essentially. And so that's a very interesting book. But if, you know, if there is anyone who would like to learn more about this, again, there are these and other excellent books that were written, some of them many years ago, when the Novus Ordo first came out. I would like to just briefly now go through the parts of the Mass and how they changed it. I mentioned last Sunday how, in general, what you really notice, of course, is the change of language, the priest facing the people, 
standing behind the table instead of facing away from the people, and you notice the lack of reverence. Communion in the hand, nobody genuflecting or kneeling. It's very rare to find that anymore. Talking in church, just the lack of reverence. But now let's go to, into a few more details. First of all, how does the Mass begin? The prayers at the foot of the altar. The priest stands on the floor. He bows profoundly as he says the confidior, and there's other bows. The servers are kneeling on the floor. It is a penitential rite of humility before we ascend the altar to begin the Mass. That has been virtually eliminated. They came in with three introductory rites, one of which had a stripped-down version of the confidior, and the other two did not have it at all. And this is interesting because with the Novus Ordo Mise, they give the priest all of these options, like the greeting of the people. You know, for us it's Dominus Phobiscum, the Lord be with you, et cum spiritu tu, and with thy spirit. Now the priest has different greetings he can use, different options for different parts of the Mass. So the same thing with prayers at the foot of the altar. But that idea of humility and of contrition for sin is virtually gone. Then we come up, they do have the Gloria, and you come to the readings. We have an epistle and gospel. Some penitential masses, like during Lent, you might have an, an extra reading. But in the Novus Ordo, they brought in a third reading as a standard practice. And you might think, well, that's good, right? More reading from Scripture. I believe they have uh, two readings, one from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament, and then the Gospel, instead of just one epistle and the Gospel. But the problem with this is they began to elevate the readings, and that part of the Mass, they called it the Liturgy of the Word. You know, that portion of the Mass traditionally has been called the Mass of the Catechumens, but they called it the Liturgy of the Word, and they said that the Liturgy of the Word is equal to the Liturgy of the Eucharist, and that God is present both in the Eucharist and in the scriptures. So what that does is it demotes, it lowers the sense of the presence, the true presence of Christ in the Holy Eucharist to say that now it's equal to the presence of God when sacred scripture is being read, which is truly the word of God. So they kind of elevate that and lower a sense of reverence for the Eucharist. Then you come to the offertory, and the first thing I would mention is the wording for the offertory and canon, or the, the speaking, is in a quiet voice. If you watch the Mass, the priest is in a silent voice, just whispering, so you can't hear those prayers, because it is part of the sacrifice being offered to God. In the new Mass, they eliminated that everything is out loud, but they especially changed the prayer for the offering of the bread and wine. Now, we say in the traditional Mass, I'm offering the host sushi pay, Sancti Pater Omnipotens Eterni Deus, Anc Immaculatam Ostiam. So receive, Heavenly Father, Almighty Eternal God, this spotless host, or this immaculate host. Now, that's the first words of the offertory of the host. Now, compare that with this in the Novus Ordo. Blessed are you, Lord God of the universe, for through your goodness, we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. Then when they offer the chalice in the Novus Ordo, the priest says, Blessed are you, Lord God of the universe, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you, fruit of the, earth, uh, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become for us our spiritual drink. Now, it's very interesting about this. You think that this is totally different. Where did they come up with it? Well, believe it or not, they took a prayer, of Jewish, a Jewish prayer before meals. What the Jewish people say before meals. They took that and used that for the new offertory prayers. And what's different is now there's this emphasis, the work of human hands. Instead of <clears throat> an emphasis on what the bread and wine are going to become shortly, at the consecration, the body and blood of Christ. And we're offering to Almighty God not only bread and wine, but also this bread and wine in view of what it will become, the body and blood of Christ, which is offered to his heavenly Father. So a very stark contrast. And there were even some commentators who thought that that alone would be sufficient to invalidate the Mass. I'm skeptical of that claim, but that's how stark a contrast that is 
from the traditional prayers. Of course, we come to the consecration. I already talked a little bit about the change of words of consecration. Another thing they eliminated was the, the majority of the genuflections. Now, in the true Mass, everything is carefully regulated. A priest cannot go to the seminary and just read over the Mass a couple times and then get ordained and start offering Mass. It takes a good six months in the seminary of practicing the Mass, studying the rubrics, preparing before the seminarian that is preparing for ordination can offer the Mass. And in fact, it's not just six months, it's his entire life, an entire time in the seminary attending Mass. But in the new Mass, as I said, there's options upon options, but there are no longer all of the rules as far as the voice of the priest. There are times when my voice is what we call the clear voice, where you can hear it. There is the silent voice, which is just whispering, where I alone would hear it. And then there is the elevated voice, which is in between, which at least the servers could hear. And that's just a few times of Mass. But the priest has to know and study when his voice is which one of the three. And how does he hold his hands? Everything is very carefully delineated. You'll notice that in the true Mass, the priest holds his thumbs and forefingers together after the consecration of the host, in case there's a particle there so it doesn't fall to the ground. And of course, as you can guess, that was eliminated with the Novus Ordo. Uh, but the way the priest holds his hands, all of that, all of those very carefully defined rubrics, the priest has, there are different bows. There's a deep bow, a medium bow, a bow of the head, and even the bow of the head, there's three different bows of the head. There's all these different vows. Now, no priest is going to be perfect when he says Mass, but he studies and spends his time studying the rubrics so that he can offer it as worthily as possible. Because during the Mass, the priest is supposed to disappear, as it were. His human personality should not be strongly evident. That should recede into the background because he is now another Christ offering Mass. But in the Novus Ordo Mise, the priest is like the personality. He has to become, as I said earlier, like an entertainer. And they have all of these sacrileges that have taken place in churches because of that. Priests feeling they have to entertain. But I've often thought, especially when I was a seminarian and studying the rubrics and preparing to be able to say Mass, to offer Mass, I've often thought, a non-Catholic, this alone, if I were a non-Catholic and I read all that the priest must learn and how he is to offer Mass, that alone would lead one to think, this must be the true church. Because no other church has so carefully a fine-tuned set of guidelines and, and rubrics for how the liturgy is performed. It, it really is fascinating to study all that the priest must do to offer the Mass. So, I, I got off on this tangent by talking about the genuflections. I think they only have two left. You'll notice in the Mass, every time the priest is going to touch after the consecration, the host and the chalice, he genuflects before and after. But in the new Mass, they have just one genuflection after elevating the host, might be before, and then one with elevating the chalice. And that's it, just those two. So a very noticeable difference at the consecration. They also have, after the Our Father, after the Lord's Prayer, they have what they call the kiss of peace. Now, this is taken from the true Mass, but it's exaggerated or corrupted, distorted from what it is in the true Mass. If you look in your Missal, when we finish the Agnus Dei, the first prayer is a prayer for peace for the peace and unity of the church. And at a solemn mass, at the con conclusion of that prayer, the priest and the sacred ministers embrace a very modest embrace, which is called the kiss of peace, and one says, peace be to you in Latin, and the other responds, and also with you or with your spirit. So that is the kiss of peace in the traditional mass. Now they've extended that in every mass to the lay people, and there's a handshake. And people are supposed to greet their neighbors and they're shaking hands with those around them in their pews. And again, there's the talking, etc. But keep in mind, our Lord is present on the altar at this time. Now, you can visit and socialize when you go through the doors of the church after Mass. But 
the mass is the time to worship God. So again, this is one more thing that trivialized and minimized the respect, the reverence due to Almighty God. We've already talked before about communion, the loss of reverence. So I want to just summarize. I know this sermon is dragging on a little longer than normal, but I wanted to go through this so that you are aware of it, to help us appreciate the true Mass, never to take it for granted. Another thing they do in the Novus Ordo is they have what's called concelebration. And they'll have a Mass offered by three, four, ten, twenty priests. And it used to be, and it is in the true, true Church, a priest is allowed to say Mass every day and would not want to omit his daily Mass, knowing what a tremendous blessing it is, what a source of grace it is for the entire church, for himself, for those for whom he offers Mass, etc., those who attend, and even for all the members of the mystical body of Christ. And so the priest would not want to omit even one Mass. But now with this concelebration, if you have ten priests, instead of having ten Masses being offered, they're offering only one Mass, and they're all sharing or, or participating in that one. So that's something new they also offered. Traditionally, that was only done on two occasions. The ordination of a priest, in which he concelebrates with the bishop, and that's his first mass, and the consecration of a bishop. So very rare, a typical priest, you've only done that once in your life, when you were ordained, offered mass in union with the bishop there. But after that, you're the celebrant for every mass you offer. Not so in the Novus Ordo Missae. So... Again, let us thank God that we have the true Mass, that we understand it, but pray that we never take it for granted. The, I would say, if we were to look at the Novus Ordo Missae and use one word to describe it, I would use the word casual, like lacking in reverence, dignity. And with the true Mass, a seriousness of prayer, of reverence, of worship. So let us make sure that we never devolve into that casual spirit when we attend Mass, but always to do so with attention, reverence, and devotion, appreciating the tremendous gift that God has given to us with the true Mass. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.